Good morning, folks. We're going to start our next panel. I hope that you've been enjoying the expo so far. And we will uh, be looking at the whole role of bioenergy with regard to this panel. We have a number of speakers. And <clears throat> our, first, our first presenter is Joanne Ivanek, who is the Executive Director of Advanced Biofuels. Welcome, Joanne. Okay, you just, do it from the table, Joanne? Oh, do it from yeah. the table? Sorry, okay. sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. That will, that will work. Okay. Make sure the microphone pops up. There you go. Okay. There you go. Now you're set. All right. Okay, well, as I was saying, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, Advanced Biofuels USA is a nonprofit educational organization. We are not a trade group, so we feel we have uh, an opportunity to really look at the big picture in uh, relationship to our renewable fuels issues. Um, what I want to talk about is watch what they do. Um, as Attorney General John Mitchell said at, in 1969 at the beginning of the Nixon administration, watch what we do, not what we say. So I'd like to apply that to that formula to the looking at the Obama administration to clearly understand what is the Obama administration's record on reducing climate change. If you listen to President Obama's speeches, he says he's a climate change leader. However, over the past six years, the actions of the Obama presidency tell a different story, don't they? Shale oil and gas fracking have boomed. Obama's opened up the Arctic and Atlantic for drilling. He has imposed no new restrictions on deep water drilling. So in the transportation sector, what does Obama reducing climate change look like? Obama promised a million clean electric cars on the roads by 2015. What did we get? Only 160,000, about 16%. And few, if any of those, are running on renewables. So is Obama really serious about providing a clear pathway to have vehicles that run on liquid fuels meet that 54.5 mile per gallon new CAFE standard? To the contrary, it appears that he and his administration are doing all they can to prevent more efficient, lower life cycle carbon footprint cars and trucks from traveling on our roads. And here's how. Three recent negative actions by the administration that hinder getting higher mileage, lower GHG cars and trucks in the marketplace. First, EPA Tier 3 regulations, which put at a disadvantage engines optimized for reasonably priced, higher octane, high ethanol fuels. Engines like the EcoBoost and Ecotech by Ford and GM, that due to high octane and cooling properties of ethanol, can get better mileage and lower life cycle carbon emissions. But these tier three regulations put those cars at a disadvantage to gas guzzling petroleum optimized engines. Remember, we went from leaded to unleaded so that we could use catalytic converters in our automobiles so that we could clean the air. The EPA could do the same kind of thing moving us to renewables if it really wanted to. Instead, what these actions add up to is a concerted effort by the Obama administration to restrict American motor vehicle and renewable fuel innovation. The results, more money out of your pocket when filling up your tank that more often than is necessary with modern technology and dirtier air, and higher carbon footprint, and preventing the growth of US jobs in the automotive industry, in the research sector, and in our domestic sustainable renewable fuel industry. So if this administration is truly serious about producing cars and trucks that go furthest using the least amount of life cycle carbon, they should start with these four actions. I'm not going to just say what the problem is. I want to give you some idea of what, what solutions are. 
An EPA CAFE and related Clean Air Act regulations aimed at that 54.5 mile per gallon goal. Set the R factor at one. You EPA folks know what I mean. What that does is it effectively acknowledges the improved life cycle carbon footprint of renewables over petroleum-based fuels. And immediately restore the flex fuel vehicle production incentives. Second, enforce the renewable fuel standard according to the laws that were passed in 2005 and 2007 to incentivize a transition to renewable transporta transportation fuel use. The Obama administration's use of current market conditions is not in the RFS legislation. That is, Obama administration is using market access and market conditions that are presided over by the oil industry as an excuse to ignore incentives that were created to wean off us off our addiction to oil, as President George W. Bush said, and someone who knows about addiction and who knows about oil. Third is a practical suggestion to address the imbalance in the oil industry dominated markets. Expand and simplify the USDA's current programs to assure that at least one blender pump with a range of ethanol fuels per station around the country gives customers a real choice of renewable fuels. Don't force them to buy 90% petroleum fuel. And fourth, something applied to both transportation and heat power. Include the price of greenhouse gas effects in the price of fuels, with the amount of the fee reflecting those greenhouse gas effects and mitigation costs. That is, charge a reasonable carbon user fee for non-renewable carbon. For example, a 4% increase of current gasoline and natural gas prices, which is less than the monthly changes we see now in our gasoline prices. And it could produce at least $14 billion a year. I have a handout that some of our assistants will have here as you're going out the door. You can stop at our booth um, and give you more details and more numbers on this. And then we'd suggest that the money collected go to renewable fuel research and infrastructure development. With the fee acting as an incentive to replace non-renewables, it will self-destruct as more renewables are used. And in the meantime, you can demand a choice and then will pay less in fees the more renewables you use. In the coming 2016 presidential and congressional elections, we need to make the benefits of renewable energy and climate change reduction an issue at every opportunity. What we, we need to watch what they do, not what they say. See what this administration has done to hinder progress towards sustainable renewable fuels and work for changes. And looking ahead, keep those candidates' feet to the fire. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Uh, we'll now hear from Morgan Pitts, who is the Manager for Communications and External Affairs with Inviva. Thank you very much, Carol, and thanks to EESI for hosting us today. It's a pleasure to be here and discuss uh, Inviva and our business with everyone. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with us, Inviva is the largest manufacturer of wood pellet fuels for electrical utilities in the world. Um, and today I'm going to give you a little background on the company and industry because it's still a relatively new topic for a lot of folks. Uh, talk a little bit about the demand drivers, basically why we're here now when we weren't here really five years ago. Um, and then talk about what we kind of see going forward and some key pieces of uh, policy that are currently being developed. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're the largest manufacturer of wood pellets for energy generation. Um, the wood pellet industry is not inherently new. Um, wood pellets have been manufactured really since the 70s. Uh, originally, they were largely used as a heating fuel and went to uh, particularly the Northeast, the upper Rocky Mountain states, uh, areas that were off of the natural gas grid uh, because they provide a much more uh, price stable heating resource. Um, what has started to change over the last five to 10 years is the interest from industrial utilities in using them to co-fire with coal or replace coal entirely. Um, and a lot of that interest is being driven by uh, inter interest in renewable energy and global renewable energy policies. Um, as I'm sure everyone in here is, has heard of the Kyoto Protocol, um, which um, 
much of the rest of the world, certainly Europe, signed on to and we uh, opted out of. But uh, the Kyoto Protocol at the highest level is what is driving uh, the demand in for wood pellets these days. Um, the European Union developed the Renewable Energy Directive, which required member states to develop renewable energy strategies, and uh, particularly Northern Europe, areas where there was a lot of existing coal-fired generation. Uh, there was a lot of interest in something like wood pellets that enables the ma maintenance of that um, significant infrastructure, as well as the maintenance of that stable power supply, um, but, or, or, uh, excuse me, but um, rapidly improves the emissions profile. Uh, when you replace coal with wood biomass, uh, multiple sources have shown you reduce uh, carbon emissions on a life cycle basis. So that is uh, accounting for the carbon that it takes everywhere from sourcing the raw material through processing and transportation. That's a, co a common misperception is that that's not accounted for, but it, it absolutely is. Um, you reduce carbon emissions uh, by about 80% uh, with when sourced from the South US and burned in Europe for fuel. Um, which so it goes to show that you would actually reduce emissions by far more than that if you used it closer to home, because you wouldn't have the uh, ocean voyage for them in the middle. Um, but in addition to reducing carbon emissions uh, pretty significantly, um, it also dramatically replacing coal with biomass reduces or eliminates emissions of mercury, arsenic, lead, sulfur, um, pollutants that cause a lot of problems with human health and also environmental health. So in, in other words, what biomass does, the reason these utilities are so interested and that policymakers in Europe have been interested in supporting this as a strategy, is that you retain your existing assets while improving the environmental profile. Now there, um, and just to talk a little bit about the European market for a second, um, right now we're projecting, and this is not we, this is actually Hawkins Wright, which is a consulting firm, um, that the demand in Europe alone is going to continue to grow over the next several years, perhaps reaching as much as 38 million tons per year. Um, it by 2020. Um, one of the common questions that we get is, well, that sounds like a lot of wood pellets. Where is it all coming from? Uh, you know, are you going out clear cutting, um, deforesting, driving deforestation? Um, the answer to that is, is absolutely not. Uh, the wood pellet industry uses low grade residuals of harvests for higher grade materials. So in other words, if you're a landowner in the Southeast US where 94% of forest land is privately held and uh, kept as an investment, um, you're growing timber on that land to make telephone poles. You're growing it to make um, saw timber, things for you know, building houses, for making furniture. Uh, that's where the majority of the, the money is. That's where you know, that's what good timber goes to. But on attractive land, not all timber can be turned into lumber because it's rotten, defective. Um, it doesn't fit you know, local market requirements. Uh, so that's a, a huge resource that actually, especially with the decline of pulp and paper in the recession, was largely going unutilized and in many cases was just left on the forest floor or burned at roadside. So we're able to take advantage of this, this low-grade material and turn it into this clean fuel. Um, and actually, just as an anecdote, as I said, one of the questions that we hear is, uh, you know, certainly from, from folks who are concerned about the growth of the industry is, you know, are you driving deforestation is just an anecdote. Between um, 2007 and 2013 in North Carolina, where Enviva has the majority or has many of uh, the majority of our operations, um, the actual forest area increased by 28,000 acres. So it's, it's actually a great story of afforestation, not deforestation in the southeast. But I mentioned that uh, you know, Europe is, is the area where there is the most demand right now, but there is certainly increasing interest elsewhere in the world. Uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, increasingly interested in using this as a resource. Japan especially is an importer of energy, pretty much whatever it uses. Uh, so you know, pellets are a better choice than coal. Since they recently shuttered nuclear plants, uh, this enables uh, the use of low carbon electricity um, instead of having to turn to fossils. Um, here in the U.S., uh, there, we are in a state of policy flux and have been for several years on this. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the biogenic uh, carbon accounting framework, um, anyone who's, who's worked in biofuels. Uh, currently, it's under review by EPA. The first framework was issued, I believe, in 2011. Um, it's currently to the Science Advisory Board, and there are a lot of questions, and there's a lot of questions about how you actually account for carbon with bioenergy. Um, the way it historically has been looked at and the way that I believe is the most accurate is that as long as you are sourcing from areas with increasing carbon stocks, so you're not deforesting, and you're not depleting carbon, um, it should be counted as a carbon neutral fuel, and then you account for the life cycle emissions. Uh, but there, there's a lot of discussion about that, and I would be happy to take questions about that in the Q&A to go into a little bit deeper before I see any eyes glaze over. Um, so you know, with that, I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up, but I look forward to having a good discussion. Great, thanks so much, Morgan. Uh, and you will see a great diversity in terms of different kinds of fuels and uh, 
biomass and bioenergy uses uh, from our, our panel participants. And so we are now going to turn to Blake Lindsay, who is the founder and chief administrative officer for Meridian Holdings Group, Inc. Uh, and this will give you another whole perspective. Blake? Thank you. Um, thank you. Pleased to be here this morning. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, um, Meridian Holdings Group, or MHG, please stop by the booth and see us um, next door. Uh, we can uh, talk more about our products and what we do. But we are a bioplastic or biopolymer company. We utilize plant-derived uh, fatty acids or plant-based oils to produce our type of uh, bioplastic. We spent the last 10 years uh, now in product development, uh, perfecting this technology. And we think about plastics and al alternatives to uses of petroleum. Um, I don't think many of us realize how much uh, we consume each year in plastics. There's over 600 billion pounds of plastics produced every year. A recent study by the University of Georgia and two other universities that was published in uh, Science Magazine, talks about 8 million metric tons ending up, in the, ending up in the ocean every year. 8 million tons of plastic. Uh, and that's all they can measure because it floats. They don't know what's not floating. They predict it could be over 200 million metric tons of plastic in the ocean today. Again, 8 million metric tons go in every year. Uh, that rate is only going to increase, uh, they predict, over the next 20 years. It's not primarily because of countries like the U.S. where we have uh, more infrastructure. It's for those developing markets and countries around the world with coastlines that don't have the infrastructure that we have here in the U.S. But we are a U.S. company today, but we certainly intend to grow and uh, we'll be in other markets around the world. I like to do show and tell, so I brought my trash today. My daughter and I stopped at Chick-fil-A yesterday for breakfast. This is just an illustration of how much plastic we come in contact with every day. So I'm just going to go through that and show you. I had oatmeal and a fruit cup. She had um, a chicken biscuit or something. And a Coke came in a polystyrene foam cup. She had a straw that was plastic, my bowl for my oatmeal, plastic, bowl for the fruit was plastic. Uh, here's a little plastic window in the bag that had my uh, sugar and fruit and nuts in there. A uh, spoon wrapped in plastic and a plastic spoon, plastic fork that I didn't use, and plastic bag plastic coated box that had her chicken nuggets in there, plastic coated box that had her hash browns in there, the lid for the fruit, the lid for the oatmeal, uh, little plastic that had the cranberries in there, little plastic bag, uh, my coffee with a plastic cup lid, I give them credit. Um, Chick-fil-A is going green. They use a paper cup that's coated with our biopolymer, so good for them. Uh, plastic, uh, this had the sugar in it, I think, the brown sugar. I'm not done yet, I don't think. Oh, yeah. No, this actually had the sugar in it. It was a plastic-coated little bag. And, of course, the plastic bag that, that the food came in. So... What, what do we normally do with this, you know, you and I, after we're done, because it's all contaminated with our food, we put it back in the bag. Oops, that's my water cup. And uh, we wrap it in plastic, and we throw it away, right? That'll never go away. That'll never degrade, and 100% of it is made from petroleum. So we believe there's a better alternative. It's good for the environment. 
It reduces the demand on petroleum. Um, the technology, like all of these uh, panelists up here today, are reporting is that uh, the technology is now enabling us to compete with petro-based uh, alternatives. Um, the Meridian PHA or the MHG product is certified by the FDA as food contact okay uh, because a lot of our uh, clients and customers want to use our products for food packaging just like we saw from our friends at Chick-fil-A. And by the way, they're a great company and I, I do a lot of business with them because I eat there a lot with my daughter. Um, so I'm not picking on them, it's just an example of uh, how we can uh, change the way the world uses uh, plastics. Um, we um, have trademarked the term agrofactoring uh, because we are uh, using plant-derived renewable feedstocks for our manufacturing process. Um, and as I said, we're located in Georgia and right now within a 200 mile radius of our facility, there's 8 million acres uh, dedicated to agriculture. And most of those farmers don't have anything to grow in the winter time. Uh, in the southeastern United States, canola is a winter crop. So as they're harvesting their peanuts or their corn or their cotton, um, as soon as they pull that material out of the, out of the ground, um, we can plant canola in November and we can harvest it in May. And then they have uh, about three to four weeks after that to plant their normal uh, crop rotation. So the farming industry is very excited uh, because we're giving them a second income on the same acreage. Um, and in our case, we're also planting a non-GMO canola oil. One of the visions we have is that uh, we'll have excess um, oil uh, production capacity over and above what we need for our fermentation process to make the, the PHA. We can rent the oil to uh, our friends at Chick-fil-A because they're already using non-GMO canola oil to cook their fries in today. And I say rent it because we want them to use it and then when they're done with it, we want it back as used cooking oil to turn it into plastic, which we could then deliver to them those cups and plates and bowls and articles that I just pulled out of the bag as a fully renewable, uh, biodegradable, food contact safe uh, plastic um, and price competitively and functional for all those applications. So thank you, I uh, appreciate your attention and look forward to talking with you more. Great, so sure. And, and please note that he does pack out his own trash. So that's a real, real benefit. And, uh, and we'll probably never think about all of this the same way again. Um, so um, thank you so much. And that's a, a, a very good segue to our next speaker, Ann Steckel, who is the Vice President of Federal Affairs with the National Biodiesel Board, because actually biodiesel can be made from some of that same, same waste oil that you're talking about. So Ann? Well, thanks very much, Carol. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Always appreciate this event and uh, the ability we have to meet and talk with folks and educate them about the biodiesel industry. So I'm with the National Biodiesel Board, and we're the trade association that represents the biodiesel and renewable diesel industries in the United States. Uh, we have plants in just about every state. As Carol said, uh, what we do is we take waste feedstocks and make them into fuel. Uh, and that fuel diversifies the diesel supply system. So um, we can take recycled cooking oil, uh, soybean oil, canola oil, algae, um, animal fats, tallow, uh, a variety of feedstocks that are traditionally um, waste feedstocks that either go and clog up our sewer systems or don't traditionally have a home uh, to be used anywhere, such as uh, a lot of that recycled cooking oil, uh, and actually becomes a value add product that then we make into a fuel um, that becomes the alternative to diesel. So. Uh, we're about a 1.8 billion gallon industry or so, uh, and if you think about it in terms of what the diesel pool is, you've got about a 60 billion gallon diesel pool. So we're still a very, a very small part of that, although we're a very, uh, uh, very much a growing part of the industry. Uh, another part of our industry that is very exciting and a growing aspect for us is called bioheat 
Uh, for those folks that are from the Northeast, you're obviously very familiar with home heating oil. So what we do is we take biodiesel and mix that into the home heating oil uh, and becomes a replacement for that traditional home heating oil, which is a very dirty and has a lot of high emissions. Biodiesel is considered an advanced biofuel, so EPA has gone through and done a life cycle analysis, which essentially says that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50%, uh, and depending on what feedstock you're using, uh, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions up to 87%. So uh, as we talk a lot about climate change and kind of what the president and the administration has going on, we are uh, a way that the president uh, can achieve those goals that they have stated, uh, that folks have talked about in terms terms of uh, reducing our, our climate, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions in terms of climate change. So uh, we're here today and we're working on that pretty diligently. Uh, the program that we work very closely with and we're a big part of is the Renewable Fuel Standard. And most people think of the Renewable Fuel Standard and they think about uh, ethanol. And uh, you'll, you'll hear a little bit from Rob about ethanol in a minute, uh, but we're a little bit different. Like I said, we uh, diversify the diesel supply system in the United States, um, whereas ethanol uh, diversifies the gasoline supply system. So uh, for us, the renewable fuel standard has really been a mechanism to grow our industry in a really sustainable, gradual way. Uh, we've been growing our industry about 300 million gallons a year, which is uh, small, but still for us a really good step in the right direction uh, and allowing our plants to really sustain and grow across the country. Uh, the renewable fuel standard, as, as you guys have heard and probably everybody knows a lot about, has really gotten a lot of heat lately. Uh, the EPA had uh, released its proposal uh, for the renewable volume obligations for the RFS. Uh, and for the biodiesel industry, uh, we don't have a number set in statute on a yearly basis. Uh, two years ago in 2012, we received a billion gallon. We, we gradually escalated up to a billion gallons. And then after 2012, we need to go into EPA and show them why we think we should be able to grow because we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, because we have jobs, we're good for the economy. You know, there's a variety of factors we go through. So we are working very closely with EPA and talking about a 300 million gallon growth or so uh, as the out years come up. And so EPA did put out the proposal. Um, it wasn't everything that we had wanted from the biodiesel and renewable diesel industry perspective. But for our industry, we do feel like what EPA put out was a step in the right direction in terms of increasing our numbers. EPA gradually increased our numbers 100 million gallons a year. Uh, clearly, we think we can do more. We know we can do more. We have production facilities all across the country in a capacity of almost 4 billion gallons that's not being utilized. So if our highest production was 1.8 billion gallons and we have a 4 billion gallon capacity, we clearly have a lot more room to grow. So throughout this comment period that we're entering in, uh, in, in right now with EPA, we're really working with them to talk to them about how we see this program growing and why it makes sense to continue to grow the biodiesel and renewable diesel sector. So, so we're gonna be working really diligent with EPA over the next few months. The comment period closes at the end of July uh, and we'll be submitting comments to them uh, on why the volume should continue to grow uh, for all of us in the renewable fuels industry, um, our friends in the ethanol industry obviously as, as well as ourselves. Um, the other aspect uh, that we uh, work closely with legislators on and on a federal policy perspective is the biodiesel, renewable diesel, and renewable jet tax credit. So there is a dollar a gallon blender's tax credit uh, that usually resides within the extenders package um, that our industry can use to continue to grow in a sustainable way. Uh, as we all know, and clearly if you're here you care about renewable energy, uh, we're competing with a very highly entrenched petroleum industry that's been subsidized, subsidized for a long time. So it's essential as, as we all sit around the table and brainstorm about how we can all kind of diversify this, uh, that we think about federal policy factors that are important in that. So clearly for us and, and for others, the renewable fuel standard and the tax credit continues to be very important in that arena. So, so those are our two federal policy issues that we've been focusing on. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk more, but I know we're under a time constraint, so uh, uh, I'll turn it back over to Carol right now. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Ann. And if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll take some Q&A, which would be great. So now we're going to hear about that other part on, uh, or one of the other parts with regard to the renewable fuel standard. And, um, <clears throat> 
Uh, Rob Walther is with us today, and Rob is the Director of Federal Affairs with POET, and they have a very interesting story. Rob. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Carol, and thank you for having us today. Um, I always love EESI panels because the folks that go before and after you, you learn so much. Um, I think my key takeaway today is that the salads my wife has me on is nowhere near as delicious sounding as uh, the Chick-fil-A <laughs> meals that your family is enjoying. So I, I will uh, endeavor to make some changes in my life here. Um, so back in October, um, I had the opportunity to come and uh, present at an EESI uh, panel uh, about cellulosic ethanol. And that was on the heels of us opening up um, our uh, first commercial sale uh, cellulosic plant, 25 million gallons, 90% clean fuel. Um, and if you go and look at the video of uh, my presentation, uh, I come across as almost giddy, uh, pretty, pretty excited. Um, because, you know, th this has been a long time in coming. When I was a staffer on the Hill, I was on the science committee, you know, that committee takes a look at new things, things that are coming up that might not ever come to fruition. Um, and cellulosic was a technology that we had uh, looked at. Well, here it was. Um, I'm now part of a company that is actually bringing it into the commercial space. Um, and so it was really exciting. Unfortunately, as uh, Anne referenced earlier, um, we are still having problems with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, their proposed volumes under the RFS. So I'm not quite as giddy today and I'm not quite as optimistic as I was back in September that you will see uh, continued rolled out of cellulosic plants. But I wanna make two key cases to you today um, that I hope you'll take away. Um, the first is that like our plant, other commercial scale cellulosic facilities have arrived and 2014 was an inflection point year. What the inflection point was uh, has yet to be determined uh, but it was an inflection point year, so I'm going to try and make that case to you. And in the second case, I'd like to uh, present an argument of why the RFS still remains so important, why it is an important part to us being able to scale up advanced biofuels in the future. So let's turn to that first point, the, the, inflection, the inflection point, whether or not 2014 we saw the ethanol industry move from first generation or traditional sources of feedstock, which is corn, uh, and was starting to make that transition into advanced feedstocks. Um, so taking Liberty, Project Liberty, which is our cellulosic plant as an example, um, we use corn stover as a feedstock. Has a high theoretical maximum amount of gallons that you can produce uh, from it uh, because it has a fair amount of sugar relative to other cellulosic feedstocks. Um, but really it comes down to the logistical and infrastructure synergies that exist uh, by bolting on a cellulosic plant to our existing corn ethanol infrastructure. Um, POET has 27 plants spread across seven states. We're the largest producer of ethanol. We know how to market this stuff. We know how to transport this stuff. Um, we wanted to put ourselves close to our existing um, producers who can haul us cellulose, corn stover, and also take advantage of the road, the rail, the power lines, the water mains, all that infrastructure that already exists at the corn ethanol plant. Um, that's money, that's upfront capital we don't need to raise when building out these plants. And that's at a time that this plant, which is 25 million gallons, same molecule as you get from corn, um, is that 25 million gallon plant is about $300 million. The same size corn ethanol plant is about $80 million, so almost 4x difference. Uh, so keep that in mind here. We need to get our capital costs down. So anything we can do at the front end to keep those capital costs down on that generation one through really generation six is, uh, is vitally important. Um, the other synergy that I think people often forget here is that when you bolt on a stover plant, you put in that stover, out comes ethanol, but then you have this leftover lignin. It's basically this fibrous mass. And what we do is we put that through a solid fuel boiler, we create process heat, and we are able to generate all the heat that that cellulosic plant needs. So we don't need any fossil fuels there. Oh, by the way, we create so much process heat that we're able to pipe that plus able, uh, able to pipe biogas that we create through an anaerobic digester on site 
over to the corn ethanol plant. The corn ethanol plant no longer uses natural gas. It is now fossil fuel free. So the corn ethanol plant, which is already cleaner than gasoline, <clears throat> actually takes on a GHG profile similar to that of an advanced biofuel. So I, hopefully the synergies are starting to make sense. Um, the result is that you have 90% clean fuel coming from the cellulosic facility. You have advanced uh, GHG level fuel coming from the corn ethanol facility. And this is for those staffers in the room, you have a cheaper product than oil. Corn ethanol is about $40 a barrel. Cellulosic ethanol is probably around 80, 85. We're going to know more as we continue to market it. But that could compete with $80 a barrel oil, and we know that we're going to start climbing back. Once oil prices recover, we're competitive again. And that's only at the early, early commercialization stages. So you know, we're going to get better at this. There are going to be economies of scale that we introduce. We're going to realize where we over-engineered this first plant. However, um, you know, I still haven't really made the case that there was an inflection point. Well, if you look, 2014, how many corn ethanol plants were being built? It's a big goose egg. There were four cellulosic plants under construction. And that's because of the way the renewable fuel standard is created. It puts a cap on corn ethanol at 15 billion gallons. All the rest of the, the uh, headspace under renewable fuel standard can come from advanced or come from cellulosic, and then obviously uh, the role that biodiesel can play. So take that into account here. Corn is capped under the renewable fuel standard. So why is an investor, why, why is an investor so interested in the renewable fuel standard? If I have such a great product that is so clean, if it's so cheap, if it's better for public health, if it's entirely domestic, why do I need the renewable fuel standard? Well, it's because our customers are our competitors. They're the oil refineries. And oil refineries are vertically integrated. And they produce oil. And so if they buy a gallon of my product, that's a gallon of their product that they produce that they can't sell. So they are unwilling to take my product. That shows that there's a breakdown in the marketplace. And that's what the renewable fuel standard. I don't, I don't care if you are the most liberal liberal or the most conservative conservative, whether it be a liberal political uh, wonk, conservative political wonk, liberal economist, conservative economist. The role of government is to, in, is to ensure that markets work freely, no matter who you are. And that's what the renewable fuel standard does, is it's trying to break the monopoly of oil. Okay, so hopefully you come away with that. So just a quick lesson in terms of investment. <clears throat> in order for me to get investment into one of these cellulosic plants, I need to prove to the investor that there'll be a return on investment, that they're going to give me some money and they're going to get that money back plus a little. And in order to do that, I need to show that there's revenue certainty. In other words, there will be revenue against which I can service my debt or whatever the credit is. And in order to show that revenue certainty, I need to show that there's a market for this product. Someone's going to buy it, and there's going to be revenue flowing in. And in order to show a market, I need often an off-take agreement or a letter of intent. And because our competitors are the ones that would buy our product, they're not willing to give us those letters of intent because they're not going to buy our product. So that's where the RFS comes in. It's supplementing for a breakdown in the market where I can't get a letter of intent. If you're a wind turbine, you go to your local utility, I say, you say, I have <laughs> electrons to sell you. The utility says, how much? And you say, here's how much. And they say, yes or no. And if your electrons are cheaper, whether it be cheaper because standalone or because you have incentives from the government, they'll buy it. If I had incentives from the government, the oil companies still don't buy my product. So hopefully that makes sense. So the takeaway here and the leave behind for you is without a functioning RFS, cellulosic will not roll out in this country. We will have built our last plant in this country. And so the next time Poet is issuing a press release, the question is, will it be in English or will it be in Portuguese? Do I have to go get Rosetta Stone Portuguese and start getting ready for uh, being the head of federal affairs in uh, Brazil, or am I going to stay here at home? And that's really the point. And so that's why I go back to, was 2014 an inflection point 
that was a positive or was it negative? So thank you for your time. Great, thank you, thank you, Rob. And I might just mention uh, at the briefing that Rob referenced last fall, there we had several cellulosic companies that were there, and basically they were all saying the same thing that they were now in the market with with product had gone commercial, but that um, uh, without certainty and policy. And of course, we hear this across the board with regard to all renewables, with with regard to everything, but without certainty and policy that the market was going to go overseas because that is where the market conditions were much more favorable. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on at USDA in terms of looking at all sorts of bio-based products and businesses uh, that USDA's uh, programs are, are fostering. And to talk to us a little bit about that is Mark Brodzinski, who is the director of the Energy Division for the Rural Business Cooperative Service at USDA's uh, um, Office of Rural Development. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just for yeah, a little background and clarification, the, uh, within USDA, as, as many of you know, we're a huge department uh, with, with various um, agencies. I represent the Rural Business Cooperative Service, uh, which is part of our rural development mission area. Uh, and really, within Rural Business Cooperative Service, our role is to provide financing programs, so mainly uh, guaranteed loans, some grants, uh, for business and economic development. Uh, this morning, I'll focus on our energy programs, uh, which is the division that I administer. Uh, and in a nutshell, uh, kind of the elevator speech, uh, the programs I administer really are loans and grants that support the rest of what the panel just talked about, uh, the production of a wide variety of advanced biofuels, of uh, bio-based products, including um, uh, bioplastics uh, soon and, and many other products. Uh, so I'm going to focus on, on a couple of our programs, just give you some highlights as to the program itself, uh, some status, uh, and then some insights as to some other activities where you can learn more about the programs. Uh, so the three programs I'll address are the Rural Energy for America program, uh, the Advanced uh, Biofuels Payment Program, and for short, our biofinery assistance program. And I'll explain that comment for short when we get to the end of this. Uh, the uh, Rural Energy for America program uh, was uh, initially authorized in the 2002 Farm Bill. Actually, all these programs are Farm Bill supported, uh, both from an authorization sense, but also from a funding sense for the most part. Uh, the Rural Energy for America program supports uh, small businesses and ag producers uh, that are interested in either implementing a renewable energy system or undertaking energy efficiency projects. Uh, on the energy efficiency side, it, it could be things like equipment, um, you know, on-farm. Uh, we do a lot of, of funding and financing of grain dryers. Uh, but it could be heating, lighting, uh, and other uh, uh, improvements that reduce the consumption of energy. Uh, small businesses are also eligible, such as grocery stores, car washes, uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, all, again, for the uh, reduction of energy consumption. On the renewable energy side, uh, it, the program uh, provides funding for uh, implementing a renewable energy system, such as wind, solar systems. Uh, we use the term biomass to be a wide variety. It could be things like uh, biodiesel, uh, ethanol facilities, uh, wood pellet facilities, uh, so a wide variety of, of biomass facilities. Uh, the program provides uh, grants or guaranteed loans, grants up to $500,000 for energy systems, $250,000 for energy uh, efficiency improvements. Uh, and loans up to $25 million. Uh, this year we had quite a bit of funding available, about $100 million total, uh, mainly because the program was delayed in getting out in 2014, the last Farm Bill. Uh, it took us a little while to update the rules. Uh, so we basically had two years of funding available. Uh, the funding um, supports basically three initiatives within the program. Uh, one is an energy efficiency and basically a technical assistance program. Uh, so we provide grants to universities, uh, electric co-ops uh, could be units of state or local government, uh, resource and conservation districts, for example, uh, to assist small businesses and ag producers uh, just doing studies, energy audits uh, for energy efficiency programs, or for technical assistance in implementing uh, their uh, renewable energy systems. Uh, that program provided $2 million of funding this year uh, in 25 projects in 24 states, so a very diverse uh, pro uh, program. Uh, in the um, actual loan and grant program for systems, uh, we're in the middle of the year, so I can't give you a lot of details as far as, as where we're going to end up. Uh, but uh, we split 10% uh, of the funds uh, and reserve it for small projects, so projects that are requesting uh, grants of 20000 or less. 
uh, and we fin just finished uh, rolling out that program and funding those projects. Uh, so we just, um, it was just over $10 million available. Uh, and in that program, we made 800 awards, uh, of which were about half and half, a little bit under, uh, it was about 325 for energy efficiency projects and little, almost 500 uh, awards for renewable energy systems um, this year. Uh, we're just starting to uh, roll out the larger projects. Uh, so we have yet $60 million available, uh, but we also have about 1,500 applications on hand throughout the country. So as you can see, it's a very active program uh, in going forward. Uh, the second program, very simply, is an advanced biofuels payment program. Uh, on an annual basis, we have $15 million. This is, again, supported by the Farm Bill. Uh, and the program it basically makes payments uh, to producers of advanced biofuels. Uh, so on a quarterly basis, uh, the producers that apply for the program report to us what their production was, and we simply prorate the payments based on their production on a BTU basis. So we kind of equate all the fuels and production to BTUs, uh, and they make payments uh, to support the production of the, the various industries. Uh, that the payments, as you might expect, are getting smaller um, because the industry is growing, uh, which is really the nature and, and the purpose of that program. Uh, the last I'll talk about is uh, really our, our, our say newest in the sense of rolling out changes to the program is the biorefinery, uh, renewable chemical, and bio-based product manufacturing assistance program. Uh, it used to be called the biorefinery assistance program, now a much longer term. Uh, the 2014 Farm Bill added the uh, renewable chemical and bio-based product manufacturing components to the program. Uh, so just um, on the 24th of June, we released uh, the new rules for the program. Um, earlier this week, we published the uh, invitation for applications, uh, and on the 16th, we're going to hold a, a rollout forum. So those of you that are uh, Washington-based or those that were interested in additional information on the program, uh, let me know. I can provide you some insights. We have, um, this is a forum that we're going to host at USDA on the 16th and have a web link uh, also for connection uh, for more information on that program. Again, that program provides guaranteed loans uh, up to $250 million to assist for the development of biofuels, renewable chemicals, and bio-based product manufacturing. Um, if you're familiar with the program in the past, uh, it supported, uh, bio, or supported advanced biofuels. So a biorefinery, uh, the major component of the biorefinery had to be the fuels. Uh, the new program rolling out still requires production of advanced biofuels by a biorefinery but it could be a minor part. It could be biofuel that they're further processing uh, into other uh, polymers, other renewable chemicals. So while we're still focusing uh, and providing support for advanced biofuels, it's also getting much more diverse uh, into renewable chemicals and other products. There's also a component to the program that will assist in financing facilities that are going to take an output of a biorefinery. So it could be a fuel, it could be a renewable chemical, or it could be a byproduct, uh, and manufacture that into an end-user product. Uh, and there we're focusing on new and innovative, and new processes, innovative processes, and innovative products. Uh, that program will have um, applications, an open application cycle, uh, and every six months we'll review applications and compete applications for projects. Uh, that program was initially uh, authorized in the 2008 Farm Bill, uh, and we have eight projects right now in a variety of, we call them active stages. The majority of them are actively planning, uh, still going through their, their planning, designing, uh, getting preparing to construct projects, uh, but most of those, again, are producing advanced biofuels. Many are focusing on woody biomass for the reasons maybe you heard here, uh, but for the production of um, cellulosic ethanol, uh, some produce um, a drop-in heating oil, and we have one uh, client that is, uh, their project is to take a municipal solid waste, so basically trash, uh, and convert it into jet fuel. So it's a pretty, uh, very exciting industry to be in. Uh, if you want more information on the program, I have some handouts. We have a booth back in the expo. Uh, feel free to, to stop and talk to us. Uh, and we also hope that you join us on the 16th for some more information. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I, I know in terms of just the reading that I've done with regard to some of these uh, trash to other fuels, like the aviation fuel, um, it's very, very fascinating. And, and I must say, it, it has always struck me, too, that biomass is the one renewable resource that can be a problem if it is not utilized. Um, and so we, it's, it's one of those things that offers up a whole lot of exciting opportunities, very different things uh, in, in terms of thinking about all of the different kinds of sustainable uses that, that can be made. And, and I guess one, one other point that I've always found 
very, very interesting is that in terms of thinking about biorefineries, the whole host of products that can come from those biorefineries, it's not just one thing at all. Um, just like an oil refinery, there are often many, many things that will come off that out of a biorefinery. You can have numerous products that, that uh, emerge there as well. So we have a few minutes left for your questions or comments. First, uh, let's go over here first. wanted to ask Morgan about the forest that you own in Carolina. I heard, and it's probably erroneous, that they were all shipped from Central Europe. Do I understand from your presentation that the round wood was used for this and only the residue was chipped and sent or pelletized and sent to Europe? <laughs> So <clears throat> two, two points there. Uh, the first one is that Inviva does not actually own any forest land. Um, so we source from uh, private landowners who grow timber to, um, as a commodity essentially to sell to multiple markets. Um, and then as far as what we actually use for pellets, we use pulp wood, which does include round wood, um, in areas where there's no other market for it. Um, we use tops and limbs of trees. We use um, chips that are made in woods from low-grade materials that couldn't be strapped to a truck, essentially to clear the site for replanting. And then we also use sawdust from sawmills uh, as a residual. So um, those are the feedstocks that we do use, but we do not take any timber that could be used to turn into any kind of solid wood product. Okay. There's a question here first. Yep. Uh, this question is also for Enviva. Um, I'm wondering uh, what you would what you do if EPA counted emissions from bioenergy under the Clean Power Plan. Um, our, our concern is that um, EPA under its draft regs is not counting emissions from bioenergy under the Clean Power Plan. And the data show that bioenergy emits at the stack uh, a lot more carbon dioxide than coal, and it can take years or even decades for new growth to sequester those emissions. So how, how would you respond if EPA did count those emissions? Well, I mean, first of all, right now, the topic of carbon accounting has, is, is fairly well discussed. Um, as far as them counting the emissions, uh, talking about at the stack, um, there are usually, there is some incremental increase, yes, in purely stack emissions. Um, but as I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, it depends on, earlier, it depends on how the carbon is accounted for. Um, the kinds of uh, studies that show that there's an increase in emissions uh, typically rely on hypothetical future states um, to make a series of assumptions about what emissions could or could not be. Uh, but when you actually take into account um, economic factors, uh, sourcing practices on the ground, a recent study by Duke University and NC State actually finds uh, tremendous benefits uh, from a carbon perspective. So I can't speak to what EPA will do. I don't have a glass ball, but I am, am very confident that what we do is a, provides good outcomes. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions? We have a couple. Okay. Here first and then ahead. Um, also for Morgan, um, I'm Mary Booth, Director of the Partnership for Policy Integrity. Um, so your estimate, just I think it would be good if you maybe clarified to the audience that your estimate of an 80% reduction in carbon emissions at the stack um, from burning wood actually depends on counting all the emissions from actually combusting the wood as zero. And so um, as my colleague said, EPA is reviewing this practice, how accounting is done now. And um, I'm just wondering what you think uh, what you think your emissions profile would look like. Do you agree with, for instance, the study that the Southern Environmental Law Center just came out with that when you do count those emissions, uh, the emissions are 2.5 times greater than the coal that's actually uh, the wood is actually replacing? And um, this was published, of course, in the Washington Post, which is, I think, uh, probably above the fold. I think probably a lot of people here saw that. So maybe you can expand and elaborate a little bit more on exactly how Enviva um, can justify just counting emissions as zero. Dr. Booth, first of all, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. I've read a lot of your work over the last few years. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, catch up a bit after the session. I would be pleased to chat with you more. But to address your question directly, uh, based on the 80% number comes from the UK government's Ofgem, the Office of Gas and Electricity Markets calculator. The, that is the office that regulates the carbon emissions for renewable energy. Based on that calculator, it is an 80% reduction. Does that, does that address your question? No. <laughs> 
Well, I'm, I'm explaining ex exactly where it uh, exactly where the number comes from. So, um, okay, uh, great, thanks. Uh, anything? Any other questions or comments for any of our other panelists? Okay, back here first. Howard Marks uh, with the Red Horse Consultants of the Bioenergy Technologies Office at DOE. Uh, my question is directed to Mark. Uh, thank you for your presentation before Bioenergy uh, 2015 conference. Um, blender pumps. Um, I think we talked about the you know, whole idea of the blend wall and expanding the market to E15 market and the announcement made by the secretary. Uh, could you give us further details about how, what the rollout's going to look like for that program? Because it has such great promise. Thank you. Yeah, I have um, maybe some limited ability in that. It's uh, actually a different um, agency within USC that's administering that. We have uh, a couple of our staff that are providing some technical support. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's a, a a grant program that is going to be awarded to a state level. Uh, so it's going to take a participation uh, from state agencies uh, to roll out the program at the state level. So it's a, a grant application um, are being received at this time uh, at the national level from, a, you know, from state organizations. Uh, and then at the state level, they will support the distribution of funds to help support uh, finding and financing of blender pumps uh, throughout each state or through the state that's applying. Um, the, it will require, though, some, obviously some um, match funding and some other participations from at the local level, uh, live on state level. Okay. Um, I want to thank our panelists for being here and talking about all of these different bioenergy uh, opportunities and uh, technologies. And of course, everybody's got booths, and so please do stop by, engage ask questions, get answers, further the discussion. That's what this is all about. Uh, and I want to thank all of you very, very much for being here. Make sure to visit everything. Um, and we look forward to seeing some of you, at least, for the next panel. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>